one of this year's advanced producers. We're both coming to you live from KBW, where we're joined by the other 10 advanced producers. Thank you for watching at home so that we can stay COVID safe. Radioactive Youth Media is where teenagers make radio stories for KUW Public Radio in Seattle. In the Advanced Producers Workshop, we've met every Saturday since January to learn advanced storytelling, interviewing, audio editing skills, and to make podcasts and radio stories. In this workshop, six of us made news stories and focused on learning journalistic reporting skills, and, this, and another six of us made creative stories and focused on learning non-traditional forms of storytelling and sound design. My favorite moment from the workshop was definitely when we spent the day making a story about Girl Scout cookies, and it turned out to be about Minna Long, and it got me in the mood for Girl Scout cookies. I love that. Now it's time to listen to the stories we've created. We'll start by playing our six stories, new stories back to back. Then we'll do a Q&A with the youth producers. Then we'll play six, the six creative stories and do a final Q&A. As you're listening, you can ask questions in the live chat and we'll ask as many as we have time for during the Q&A. We ask you to remember that this is, online, this is an online event and is a youth friendly space. Any harmful or offensive comments in the online chat will be removed. So without further ado, let's hear some radio magic. Woo! Producers report on topics like school lunch policies, the politics of wearing makeup, the power of libraries during the pandemic, and the evolution of queer identities. Enjoy. When you think about libraries, you might picture the maze of bookshelves, the tables and chairs, or maybe even the squeak of an ungreased wheel as a librarian walks by with a book cart. It just seems cozy there, you know? It's just you, the books, and your thoughts. Those are some teens in the Seattle area sharing what they remember about going to the library. All that went away when the pandemic hit. But teens eventually found a new way to hang out the library. Radioactive's Emily Chua reports. When 10th grader Shelton Kanjiraza is looking for something to do, she'll often turn to the library. She told me about one of the first programs she attended. It was a workshop where she created a map of an imaginary fantasy land. I actually still have the map that I drew over there. Wanna see it? About a year into quarantine, Shelton was browsing the library website. There, she discovered the programs the library offers, from gaming sessions to cooking classes. A couple programs, including that map drawing one, caught the artsy teen's eye. That's where she connected with a group of teens that plans these events for the library. I went to a few of their meetings, and then when I learned that it was like hosted by teens, at the end, like they give you this survey to fill out, and at the very bottom, it's like, do you want to participate? And I'm like, yes. Shelton volunteers with the teen advisory group in Federal Way, one of several in the King County Library System. Pre-pandemic, she'd visited the library a few times a month to find new books. Now, she's meeting online every week to plan events for other teens. Currently, we are trying to do like this cooking events and we try to do this book club. Yeah, we also had some bullet journaling events. Bullet journaling is where you organize your thoughts, goals, and to-do lists in a notebook, but with some extra artwork and design flair. All those programs are held online, but that wasn't always the case. The transition to online programming was a tough one. So when we first um, closed our libraries to the public, we thought it would be for two weeks. Rachel McDonald oversees teen programming for the King County Libraries. She says the pandemic forced them into very unfamiliar territory. We realized that we had to think about how we were going to serve our community differently without our buildings being open. And that was a huge shift for us in terms of um, thinking about how we deliver programs and services. Uh, in the past, we had not delivered any programs and services online. There were some rare exceptions, but we were 100% in person, and suddenly we found ourselves 100% online. They made that huge shift in just a few weeks. McDonald says it was a little bumpy at first, but... We managed to do it, and we managed to do it in a better way than we ever thought possible. Part of that was because the teen advisory groups were willing to step up and work together to organize cool events. It was tough for teens to hang out during quarantine. Exchanging chat messages in virtual classrooms turned out to be a sorry substitute for catching up in the hallways. But online library programming turned out to be a great place for teens to vibe with their friends. Between missing out on face-to-face -face interaction and stressing over online school, teens found a sanctuary in just kicking back and doing stuff they liked. Here's Shulton again. Yeah, like something like 
easy and like not easy but i just mean like uh, nothing like nothing to worry about you know it's like to lift stuff off your shoulders so you can like relax and have fun and while some teens craved being social others found ways to give back lynn tran volunteers as a reading buddy someone who helps little kids learn to read one of her favorite memories is watching this really shy kid grow into a more confident reader i remember the first time he like did not speak at all the next day he came back, he started talking more, we started reading, and then eventually it got to the point where he was like reading all the time. Lynn says she loves the energy little kids have and appreciates their unique creativity. Stories like these point to teens' resilience and willingness to adapt during the pandemic. Perhaps we can all take a page from their book and let our human need to connect lead us to new possibilities. Oh, and get this. Last year, teens hosted and helped run 130 programs for King County Libraries. For Radioactive Youth Media, I'm Emily Chua. It's Pride Month, and hundreds of thousands of people of all ages are participating in LGBTQ Pride events across the region. Radioactive Youth Media's Lynn Sherbert Cohen looked into how the queer experience has changed and stayed the same over the decades. As an 18-year-old queer teen, I wanted to know what growing up queer in the U.S. was like before the internet and marriage equality and TV shows like Drag Race and Posed. So I talked to Bill. It's Bill, or actually William, and if I'm in trouble, it's Henry William. Bill Thielman is 75 years old and a longtime Seattle resident. He describes himself as gay, male, openly gay. And there was a time when I started out that was not always a choice. Bill grew up in a white, well-educated, middle-class family in the suburbs outside of New York City. I asked Bill to tell me about his experiences growing up as a queer person. He started with a story from the summer of 1969. The Vietnam War was going at it. Bill was 22 years old and he had just graduated from college. He was called to Fort Hamilton in New York for a draft physical. He gets there, and he's given some paperwork to fill out. One of the questions was a checklist, and it asked if I had ever had measles, mumps, chicken pox, homosexual tendencies, tuberculosis, polio, and I'm kind of like, oh, okay, yes, yes, no, no. Ugh. The burning question. At first, this story caught me off guard. But then I remembered that gay and lesbian people couldn't serve openly in the military until 2011, when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. As we talked, Bill told me stories about being targeted by the police for being gay and living through the AIDS crisis, both things that disproportionately affected people not like Bill, like Black and Latinx queer people, trans women of color, and poor queer people. But throughout Bill's stories, there was one constant the joy he finds in the queer community. Bill says, back in the 1970s, The gay community was just blooming. Stonewall had already happened, so there were marches in Manhattan, you know, the Pride marches, and Bette Midler came to Washington Square and sang, You've Got to Have Friends. Just wonderful. Hearing Bill's stories about his experiences, good and bad, made me think about the current experiences of young queer people in our country. There's a new law in Florida that restricts teaching about gender and sexual orientation, and a new law in Alabama that makes it a felony to provide gender-affirming medical treatment to transgender youth. I asked two of my friends about their experiences as queer teens. Hi, my name is Erin Stewart, and I'm 17. Hi, I'm Maddie Goldstein, and I'm 18 years old. I've known that I was bisexual since I was about six years old, and luckily for me, I grew up in a really accepting home where I was immediately embraced and accepted. My experience being queer has been a difficult one. I didn't realize that I was queer until maybe a year and a half ago. In many states, there are people working extremely hard to make sure kids like me don't get to be their true selves. For example, the don't say gay bill implies that someone will be gay if they hear about the word, which is just not true. I love being queer and I love my queer community who is always joyful and creating all types of wonderful art and community events. 
There's nothing wrong with being queer. In fact, it's a gift. Being queer is a gift. My queerness has given me a deeper appreciation for my supportive parents, teachers, and friends. It's helped me love my body, and it's allowed me to let go of societal expectations of the way things should be. While being out as queer is sometimes painful, the joy and community that comes with it is worth it. From Radioactive Youth Media, I'm Lynn Strober cohen During the pandemic, Washington schools began providing free lunch to all students. But schools are not required to offer meals that accommodate students' religious beliefs, like kosher or halal meals. Radioactive youth media's Rama Abdulaziz looked into how not having halal lunch options at school affects Muslim students like her. As a sophomore at Kent Meridian High School in Kent, who is also Muslim, I can tell you, school lunch is hard. Picture this. You're running to the cafeteria. It's crowded. You finally make it to the front of the line and take a peek at the menu. The main entree today is a barbecue chicken wrap. But for Muslim students who eat halal, you only have a few options, like the last piece of cheese pizza or the PB&J. Food that's halal is food that is permissible according to the rules of Islam. Pork is never halal, but... Meat like chicken and beef can be halal, depending on how the animal was raised, slaughtered, and prepared. Students who eat halal can eat vegetarian meals, but there's just not a lot of options at school. I talked to other Muslim students at Camp Meridian High School who eat halal to find out what they have for lunch. Um, For lunch, on the daily, I have Starbucks drink and a cookie. That's all. I have cheese pizza every day because that's the only halal option. Same. I don't eat lunch either. <laughs> um, I don't eat lunch every day. I don't eat anything. Um, I don't eat anything. I don't eat anything. My classmates' answers aren't surprising to me. I'm one of those students who ends up going to Starbucks for a refresher and a cookie. But it got me thinking, how does this affect students? There are so many of us. Kent Meridian is one of the most racially diverse schools in the state and has a huge Muslim population. I asked some other Muslim students at Kent Meridian about how not eating lunch affects them. Here's Sarar al Naimi and Hamza Ahmed. So I think the limited halal options in our school can really like affect us as people and like our school performance. Because like, let's say you get hungry and all, and you can't think straight in class, you might feel really like, you know, tired and stuff that might just, you know, get you distracted or like you might get anxiety. Usually the days where the school provides halal options and I do eat lunch, I feel like I'm able to tackle a lot more work and I'm way more energetic rather than the days where I don't eat lunch. I just start to feel way more tired way earlier and I just feel like I'm less productive. Personally, I get so much anxiety when I don't eat. I get so tired and I can't stay awake in class at all. Some students go off campus to nearby restaurants or stores for lunch, but it's expensive. Not everyone is allowed to leave campus and there's no guarantee you'll find halal options. For me, I can choose between Starbucks, Subway, or a gas station. And if you don't have money, well... A lot of us know which teacher has a snack drawer with halal snacks that she spends her own money on. It is possible for schools to serve lunches that meet religious guidelines, federal nutrition standards, and student taste. Public schools in New York and Michigan have piloted lunch programs where the entire menu is halal. If it were up to me, Washington schools would offer meals that are inclusive and culturally diverse because all students deserve to eat school lunch without compromising their beliefs. For Radioactive, this is Rama Abdulaziz. If you wear makeup, you have likely gotten mixed messages about what's the right way to wear it. This can be confusing for a young woman when you get so many other messages from family, friends, social media, or even society. Radioactive Najima Abadur has a story about her evolving relationship with makeup. I remember the first time I got mixed messages around makeup. 
I was about eight years old and it was my sister's graduation party. She was putting on makeup. I was wearing a black and green dress. I looked over at her eyeshadow palette and noticed a sparkly green shade and begged her to let me try some. I was so excited. I had never worn makeup before. As I walked out to meet all the guests, I just felt so cool. Like I was a pop star walking out on stage to meet all my fans. But a family member I barely knew stopped me immediately. He told me to take it off and never wear makeup again. It was a strange feeling from being so excited with my sister to have someone tell me what I was wearing was wrong. My relationship with makeup is something I'm still trying to figure out. I wanted to talk to someone who's been through it, so I turned to my friend Johanna for her perspective. She's 22 and someone I look up to. I was never allowed to wear makeup as a child. Johanna came from a very religious conservative family that didn't like the idea of makeup. But as she got older, she started wearing it anyway. You know, I did every what everyone did, you know, the, the like three layers of blue eyeshadow and, <laughs> you know. I had a lot of fun experimenting with makeup, but also I think it came at a time where I was dealing with immense insecurity. I had a lot of like hormonal acne, and so I would try my best to cover it up with powders and foundation. Johanna's introduction to makeup is a very familiar one. Many young women feel like they have to wear makeup, and usually in a particular way. And then you know, like, now everybody wants to be gleaming, everyone wants to, like, be glowy, but in the past, everyone wanted to have, like, a powdered face, no oil, no shine. Johanna said that it just took time to find the routine that worked for her. I felt like I could relate to everything Johanna said, but there was one big piece that I didn't relate to at all. Johanna is a white woman with Eurocentric features. She said part of her privilege was that she didn't feel pressure to contour her face or make her nose slimmer. One thing that probably plays a huge role in my relationship with makeup is that I already fit like a standard of beauty that is acceptable and um, desired in um, Western culture, right? or actually all around the world. But I was someone who felt like I had to fit into that standard. I felt like I had to have a sharper nose or lighter skin. Social media played a big part in that. At first, I used to wear a lot more makeup because it was something I saw in everyone around me and online, but I didn't always feel comfortable. But during the pandemic, I was able to experiment and see what worked for me. My circle of friends and time really helped me learn it all. And now my routine is a lot more simple, it goes under eye eyeliner, concealer, mascara, and eyebrow gel. And glitter in the corner of my eyes, that part is kind of essential. I was curious about Johanna's routine. Sunscreen. Sunscreen every time, you know, because I'm white. <laughs> okay, so my makeup routine uh, is pretty basic. I wear sunscreen. And um, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll do, like, uh, under eye, like, some liner, um... And I like mascara a lot because my eyelashes are pretty light. And I love doing my brows because they're like curly and they go everywhere. So, Although I have a routine I like, I can't always ignore all the other opinions. It's hard when some people think makeup is cool or some people think it's because you're insecure. And some people think women wear makeup for male attention. We need to wear just enough makeup to be beautiful and to meet a standard, but not enough that it's really visible. I feel like there's, there's no way to get around it. It's like you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Makeup is a really cool outlet that people have to explore and be creative, regardless of what everyone thinks. Even though it can feel like you have to keep up, trends don't always have to be a bad thing. You can open up Instagram, Pinterest, or TikTok and see something that you want to explore. I think makeup is an art form. And with these trends, you can be inspired to try something new. I want every young woman like me to find their personal relationship with makeup or no relationship at all. Women should be free to express themselves in whatever way, free of criticism and free of judgment. For Radioactive, this is Najuma Abadir. Here's a little known fact about school lunches. School kids of all ages can go into debt because they can't pay for their lunch. They may get the food, but students and their families are responsible for paying for it. And if they don't, students as young as six years old can end up owing money to the school. Radioactive's Colin Yin reports. During the pandemic, school lunches became free for everyone. This was made possible by government waivers that provided funding for free lunch programs. 
Those free meals for everyone ended up addressing something called school lunch debt and the stigma that can come with getting these free lunches. Before the pandemic, students could get free and reduced lunches, but they had to meet certain requirements. So, for example, families with low incomes were eligible, but... It's also like very complex and you have to have all of your like paper and your income and all that stuff prepared. So it's like super long and super complicated. Melissa Takai grew up in Seattle and experienced this problem firsthand. I remember my mom would spend a lot of time just like making me lunch, even though she had like, I don't know, two or three jobs when I was a kid. Her family qualified for free lunches, but her parents didn't enroll her. Her parents' first languages are Japanese and Thai, and that created a language barrier that made it harder to get free lunch. If a student is hungry and hasn't signed up for free lunches, their school still has to feed them but still charges the student, something around 2 to $4 per meal. If students can't pay for that, they go into debt, meaning that young students can end up owing the school money. That's exactly what happened at the school that Seattle parent Jeff Liu's kid attended, where a student owed around $100 in school lunch debt. That's why he started an organization to help address it. And it's just one of those things that they should not have to worry about where their next meal is going to be. Some schools even used to make students wear a stamp or a bracelet, which was meant to let families know that their students owed lunch money. But they stopped doing this in 2018 when the governor signed a bill to stop the stigmatization of students not being able to pay for meals, also known as lunch shaming. State Representative Strom Peterson, a sponsor of the bill, says that you will not be able to stamp their hand or put a band around their wrist, um, things like that. You will not be able to kind of have a, a public conversation with that child. Even with these anti-lung shaming bills, Jeff Liu says that even today, there's a stigma for students and their families. As, you know, a kid that uh, other students are like, oh, they're getting the brown bag meal or they, they're, they're getting the free lunch. So they might, might be that poor kid. Jeff Liu says during the pandemic, everyone got to eat equally. So you don't know who you know, are coming from a tough background or a family that's struggling, which is nice because, you know, Joseph, let's say, is, you know, eating a school lunch. Jenny's eating a school lunch. They don't know about each other's family backgrounds and if they're struggling or not. And everyone just gets a meal. The whole point of school is to focus on learning. And Melissa Takai says that when young people aren't eating, it's hard for them to do their best work. So then it's like, what's the point of school if I don't have the energy and stuff to do that? Right now, it seems that free lunches for everyone will be ending now that we're coming out of the pandemic. Jeff Liu wants people to reach out to lawmakers and tell them that they want lunches to be free for all students. Because in the end, no one can learn on an empty stomach. For Radioactive Youth Media, this is Colin Yeen. It's prom season, and my friends are looking for outfit inspiration. We're all looking at the dress that trans actress Hunter Schaefer wore to the Met Gala. It's silver, shiny, and futuristic looking. My friend Mickey is planning on recreating the dress. I don't know if it'll come out good, though, because it's, it's like silver, and like, it's got like rhinestones. It like it's, it's like it real like stones for her, but for me, it'd be rhinestones, it so I don't like, know if it would look it good like at all. It looks like a cheese grater. <laughs> oh, it does. It kind of has a cheese grater. Mickey is openly gay and non-binary, so for them, seeing LGBT people like Schaefer in the media is inspiring. They feel seen as a gay person. To me, gay representation is, it's like painting the picture of what a gay person is. And without that, you can't really understand like what a gay person is. Mickey says that visually, LGBT representation may look like pride flags waving in the air, non-binary pronouns proudly displayed on masks, and gay characters on TV. Representation in music is especially impactful to them. I, I think like the biggest place I actually go to for representation is music because I, I love music more than anything. So seeing people like Lona Sex in music is really great, especially because he makes great music. But being from Greenville, South Carolina, it was rare for Mickey to actually see their representation. Sometimes when conversations about the LGBT community actually did come up, it was to say something rude or offensive. At times, Mickey even felt unsafe. I was scared of being like judged, especially in public. There's a lot of hate groups down there, so I could have definitely been like beaten up for being gay. That doesn't mean there aren't gay communities in South Carolina, though. Mickey even says they are able to be part of a small LGBT community in their school. 
However, it was still difficult for Mickey to actually feel accepted as a gay person outside of their friend group. But this changed a couple years ago, when Mickey and their family moved to Seattle. Here, Mickey sees pride flags almost everywhere they go. As Mickey put it, gay representation in Seattle is everywhere. Even their school, which teaches 6 through 12, has a largely open LGBT community. No, that was really surprising for me, seeing a young kid in like middle school being gay or being trans is so it's so new to me and it's so surprising to me and it's really it's really cool to see that it's like it's really nice to like hear that kids out here are being accepted for who they are but in some schools that open lgbt expression is going to change with new laws like florida's parental rights and education bill also known as the don't say gay bill lgbt discussions in schools will be limited Young people that are gay or questioning may not be able to talk to their teachers or classmates about their own identities. Gay students may not be supported when they should be. Years ago, Mickey had many questions before coming out. They had no one within their school to talk about these questions with. But luckily, Mickey was able to find an adult that they could depend on. They haven't talked in a while, so Mickey decided to give him a call. Hello. Hey, Jed. Hey, what's up? Jed Derryberry is an educator and author, but to Mickey, he's Uncle Jed, a family friend. Like Mickey, Jed grew up in South Carolina and is openly gay. But the two of them grew up in different times. For Mickey, there was some support for gay people. For Jed, gay acceptance was almost non-existent. As a young man, there was nothing and no one to tell him that it was okay to be gay. Um, So I didn't even really know who or what I was fully until I got much older. In fact, he used to believe he wasn't even meant to be gay. He was told to pray it away. Jed even went to conversion therapy, a practice known to try to cure homosexuality. It is now banned in several states, including Washington. Jed describes his time in conversion therapy as some of the worst years of his life. No amount of praying, no amount of service, no amount of therapy fixed it. If anything, it just solidified it, that this is who I was. This is the way that I was made. There's a verse of scripture that says you are fearfully and wonderfully made, and I had to accept that I was fearfully and wonderfully made this way. In his 30s, Jed began to feel like he was actually okay to be gay, to be himself. Jed found gay people represented through shows like Will and Grace, and believes their gay characters actually help the people that they're portraying. But had I seen that in my formative years, you know, between like 10 to 15, and, and, and see that you could be a thriving gay person with a career and be successful and have friends and your parents would love you and life would be quote unquote normal, um, I think it would have had a huge difference on how I came out. Media representation isn't the only thing that helps people feel validated though. Role models and mentors can also offer emotional support. Jed gives credit to a friend of his that he thinks of as his role model for helping him come out. He asked me one day, so are you just gonna live a lie for the rest of your life? He said, I can't imagine how exhausting that's going to be. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks that he's right. You know, I I can't keep living this lie that I was. And that was in October of 2012. And I came out in December of that same year. In sophomore year, Mickey decided it was time to come out to their parents, something they were holding off for a while. Needing guidance, Mickey pulled out their phone and messaged Jed on Instagram. I said, hey, Jed, I need advice. I said, "Okay, if I can help, what's up? I said, I'm bisexual, and I don't know how to come out to my parents. Knowing how loving Mickey's parents are, Jed told Mickey this. He said, if there's ever parents to come out to, you have them. Even though this was a quick exchange online, it was enough to make Mickey feel better about coming out. And they did so the following day. For Mickey, just having an adult in their life to turn to for support was more than enough. This is what young gay people may lose if more bills like Florida's Don't Say Gay become law. Kids who might be questioning themselves might feel weird about being gay. Um, it might feel different or alienated. So it's important to have that in schools to help them understand that it's normal and it's okay. By having mentors in their community, Mickey and Jed can ask questions to learn more about themselves and other gay people. By limiting how gay people can talk about who they are, we're only taking steps back on the progress that we have made with gay acceptance. In conversations like this, is an example of what we could lose. Um, so I wanted to really talk about how you impacted my life as a gay adult uh, in like my middle school life mostly. Um, mm-hmm. I, I never really 
said that I appreciated you being there for me when I needed you. Um, mm-hmm. You're like the only gay person I knew of that was an adult in South Carolina. Um, it was nice yeah. to have you there, and I really appreciate you being there for me when I needed you. Well, I, it it means the world for me to hear you say that. Yeah. And um, I appreciate you saying that so much because, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't have that. I, right. I still, um, I think back into my, you know, until I was in my 30s, did I really know another adult gay man who was out and proud? And, you know, it, it was a... A, a big step for for me to come out even in my mid 30s um, right. but i realized when i did how immediately it impacted others like you and so mm-hmm. um i i'm so glad i did because if it helped you then that that was all worth it you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i still remember that i still remember that day when you sent me the message on instagram i mean <laughs> i was just like i was so proud of you because i knew the courage that that took yeah. Um, but then I was also really proud of me because you trusted me to share that. So I was with me. So I was very proud of that mm-hmm. moment. It, it just is a, a big thing to have a role model. So I'm, I'm just honored that I'm one of yours. <laughs> yeah. Before the conversation ended, Jed had this to say to Mickey. Um, you know, I think sometimes we have this misconception of what advocacy is. We think that it's making a sign and standing on the corner and yelling at people. I think that's what we think advocacy is, but advocacy is anytime you speak up for your authentic self, and that's what you're doing right now, and I'm I'm so thrilled. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was great to talk to you, Jed. Yeah, it was good to talk to you, too. I love you. I love you, too. Bye. For Radioactive, I'm Antonio Navarez. Wow, those are such powerful stories. Thank you for everyone who listened. I'd like to invite each producer to share either one thing they're particularly proud of or one thing that was challenging um, producing their story. So um, let's start with Emily. Right, something that I'm proud of is just the voices that were in this story. Um, I was able to talk to a lot of different people for this. I talked to Schultz and the team. Um, I talked to Rachel McDonald um, with the library. And there are even more voices I really wanted to fit in. Um, other teens, uh, library expert uh, Katya Fimova. I'm just really glad that I was able to get that spread of voices. Thank you for that. Um, Lynn, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, so one thing I'm really proud of is a lot of times in media, especially turned and queer people, there's like a lot of like the queer experience always ends in like sad or like not getting to a place where they're at least like comfortable or happy and so through this story i wanted to share that like yes it's not always going to be easy to be queer but like those moments of joy and like happiness and being able to be your authentic self are super real and are like a great part of being queer and for anybody that was amazing and Najima, do you want to go next um, I'm really proud that like I got to be a little more personal with my story, but also like to tiny things like with sound and music. Yeah, I love that. Um, next, let's do Colin. Yeah, for me, something I'm really proud about is um just how deep I was able to go with this story. Um, it's a topic that I didn't really know about uh beforehand, so just being able to dive into it and learn about such an important issue is something that uh. I found really exciting and that's something I really enjoyed. I feel that. Last and Antonio. Well, I was just really proud to have the story be made because I've had the idea for it for over a year. Um, Mickey is a friend of mine that I joke around with a lot. We're not ever very serious, but you know, when I learned that Mickey came from South Carolina, but they're still openly gay, openly non-binary, I was just so surprised by it. Um, and I don't think I really told Mickey this, but I look up to them a lot because I grew up in like a more like accepting place, but I still find it difficult to be my true self. Um, and that like phone call lasted about an hour. 
And it was kind of funny at times. It got very serious at times. I'm just really glad that I got that part that was included in the story. Thank you for that. Um, we have two questions from the audience. Um, one, it's for Najuma. What was the most surprising or new thing you learned about makeup while reporting your story? Um, is this pretty? I'm not sure actually um, about like makeup specifically, but one thing that was really cool was to like explore different beauty standards. And like, you know, I never really like, you know, talked to someone about their experience with it. And yeah, it was pretty cool. That's great. This one's for Lynn. Will you do anything differently in your own life now that you talk to and learn from someone that was here from like an older generation? Um, yeah, I think that like, a lot of times we kind of like do not think about like the history of the queer community a lot and like acknowledge these really big moments like the HIV AIDS crisis that was so impactful. Um, I think also to acknowledge that like our community is ever evolving and it's not like, you know, just like how the world keeps spinning. Like there's constant evolution of terms and ways that we can identify and um, become closer with both others and ourselves. And I think that that is super cool and something to keep an eye out for. That's amazing. Um, thank you everyone and congratulations on completing your stories. <laughs> Our final six stories come from the creative audio team. These six producers play with non-traditional forms of story structure and sound design. Some of the stories you'll hear are fiction, some are nonfiction, and some are somewhere in between. Enjoy. Choices, wins, and losses. High school is kind of like a video game. Radioactive's Elena Lee explores this idea through this fictional audio piece. Welcome back to High School Hustle, Andy. Congrats on completing junior year with a 4.0 GPA. Ready to start your senior year? Andy, have you decided what you want to study in college? Ugh. Level one, tough conversations. Can you make it through this family dinner without disappointing your parents? Your father and I always wanted you to be a doctor. You have three options. One, lie and sail into the medical field. It would make your parents happy. Two, reveal their interest in, ugh, journalism. Or three. I don't know yet. I'm still exploring my options. You chose number three. I have time. We understand that, but you'll be the first person in our family to go to college. You need a plan. You should talk to your cousin. He makes amazing money as a pharmacist. Uh-oh, your parents are disappointed. Minus five mental health points. Andy. Level two, the college list. Scroll through each college and listen to the representative. Swipe right if you wish to apply. Swipe left if you don't. Ready? Start! Anchor University is your trusty state school. Who can say no to in-state tuition? It's only 25 minutes away from home. Chapter University transforms students into great truth seekers and storytellers. We have one of the best journalism programs in the country. At Home Run University, we love sports. Proton University is the place for all things STEM. Most would describe Posh University as being pretentious, but... Ugh, my brain hurts. You completed your college list. Great choices, Andy! Level 3. Sudden Death. Win over colleges with your personal statement! You have 30 seconds. Ready? Start! What? Uh... Public speaking empowers me. Too boring. Choose something else. Um... 
When my best friend moved away, I was heartbroken. She was- This essay needs to be about you. Ugh, I have no ideas. There must be something. Dig deeper, Andy. Well, I've always felt disconnected from my family's culture. Now we're getting somewhere. Keep writing. Use more emotion. Too sad. Be uplifting. Is that the best you can do? And done. You finished your personal statement. The ambitious officers will love it. Are you ready to submit your college applications? Nice work, Andy. Uh-oh. Looks like you had to unpack a lot of emotional baggage in your personal statement. Minus 10 mental health points. Be careful. You're approaching burnout status. Level four, the final choice. You ended senior year with a bang. You committed to the local state school. You passed all your AP exams. You danced the night away at prom. And you graduated. You received a diploma surrounded by friends and family. You did it, Andy. That's it? Hey Andy, did you enjoy High School Hustle? The fun doesn't stop there! Your subconscious is proud to present our newest game coming this fall! College Craze! Get ready to room with complete strangers, collect student debt, and cry a lot! Do you want to play? Huh, the game doesn't stop after high school. Do I actually want to go to college? Andy, are you there? Click yes! If you want to go to college, click no if you don't. Four years of this game. For what? I don't even know who I am. I don't want to live like this for the rest of my life. You clicked the quit button. You meant to click the pause button, right? No, I'm done with this game. Done? You, you, you only got this far because of me! You're nothing without me! I don't need you. I tried to win this game. I tried to win your approval. But where did that get me? I want to be happy. And that means ending this. You, you, you can't quit. No, no, no one quits! I can and I will. Thank you for listening to Radioactive Youth Media. This podcast was produced by me, Elena Lee. It was inspired by Call of Dating, written and produced by Meryl Burtwin-Tonic and Crystal Duhame for the CBC radio show Wiretap. I'd like to shout out my team of voice actors, Adar Abdi, Antonio Navarez, Colin Yeen, Emily Chua, Lucas Galarno, Lynn Struber cohen and the Juma Abader. Special thanks to my mentor, Esme Jimenez, peer mentor Lucas Galarno, and editor Mary Heisey. Until next time, game over. Hey, you're listening to Radioactive. As a heads up, this is a story about sexuality, and it briefly mentions sexual trauma at the beginning. Please take care when listening. When I was younger, I didn't really think about my sexuality or what I wanted from it, but I started to get a lot of attention. This led me to one of my first sexual experiences, which was negative and non-consensual. This held me back from feeling grounded in my body and sexuality. Although it happened years ago, my ability to feel completely comfortable in my body eroded. It made me feel uncomfortable around the idea of being sexual and largely led to me having body image issues. A few months ago, I stumbled across a YouTube video called The Try Guys Try Pole Dancing. Pole dancing, pole art, sexy pole stuff. I really have no idea how this will go. I'm very afraid that I'm not strong enough to do it. The video was really funny, but it also covered some serious topics. I never thought that pole dancing could have anything to do with reclaiming your own body. Some of the teachers talked about their own healing from trauma through pole dancing. So I decided to try it. I looked up the nearest pole dancing studio and took my first class. 
pole is a sanctuary. It has deepened my self-love and boosted my confidence. It's an allowance and appreciation for myself as a sexual being to be fully myself in front of others who respect and value my body as my own. I felt the change in me, but I wondered if the change was clear to others. There's been a lot of change in you. I've seen your confidence go way up and you started just like walking with more confidence and talking with more confidence and acting with more confidence. It was like a really significant change. And I was really impressed and I was like, oh my God, I gotta try this. You did try it. I did. And how did that go? I felt free to be like a sexual being without being sexualized and it was so freeing and, and wonderful and I had so much fun. That was my best friend, Anna Hurtado. And this is what my pole dancing classes sound like. Yet my experience around pole dancing hasn't come without opinions, and oftentimes discomfort from others. Pole isn't inherently sexual. As long as you don't post about it, it's fine. It's a pole fitness thing. I like actual stripping. I want to come watch you in your classes. You talked about pole dancing, so it only makes sense that they thought they could make sexual comments. Come watch you watch. Pole, so it only it's makes sense that it's sexual, sexual, sexual comments. Pole isn't inherently sexual. I want to come watch you in your classes. After a couple months of classes, I felt as though I had a breakthrough. It was when I decided to dance to Power by Billie Eilish. This song was powerful in my pole journey because it felt like it was telling my trauma story for me. It released something in me that had weighed me down for years, and I stopped caring what people thought. I've now been pole dancing for nine months, and I've learned a lot. It's been eye-opening seeing the discomfort people feel towards pole dancing and sexuality in general, not to mention the negativity society seems to have towards sex work. Pole dancing is rooted in sex workers' spaces and communities. I cannot celebrate pole dancing without celebrating sex workers. My experience as someone who came to pole dancing as a hobby in a studio is completely different from someone who learned pole dancing as a job to pay rent and put food on the table. The fact that I can tell my story of healing through pole dancing when so many sex workers are silenced or gaslighted when they try to talk about their trauma says a lot about the balance of power in society. That's where I am in my pole journey. Learning about poles, roots, and sex work, listening to sex workers, and supporting sex workers' rights. For Radioactive, this is Morgan White. Special thanks to all my voice actors and my dance studio, Divine Movement, that set up a special dance class for me to record audio. My mentor, Diana Capalam, my peer mentor, Is Ortiz, my editor, Mary Heisey, and last but not least, my story consultant, Stacy Clare. Her book, The Ethical Stripper, helped inform my thoughts and feelings throughout the telling of this story. To dive deeper, including more on sex workers' rights, check out our web post on KOW.org. From one first-generation American to another, I know the feeling of being the odd one out. So I'm talking to a good friend about these feelings and thoughts while cooking a delicious meal. So Hina, can you tell us first where we are? We are in White Center in my kitchen. I have lived here my whole life and it's the only place I know as home. Okay, I have to ask, since I can already smell the amazing aroma in your house, please tell me what you're cooking. Yes, of course. I'm currently trying to make tandoori chicken. My mom has always made it for me growing up. And because it's Ramadan, we want to spice it up a little and try different recipes out. Yeah, that sounds delicious. Can you tell me a little bit about your culture, maybe some of your favorite foods? Yeah, so my parents come from India and we are Gujarati. So we eat a lot of sak, which is like stir fry. Um, And something I really enjoy making is butter chicken and mango lassi. I even have a cat named mango lassi, so I really enjoy making it. Oh my god, that's so cute. I love that name for a cat. Tell me why is food important to your family? Whenever we eat food, we're happy. We feel safe and we feel secure. Food just brings a sense of community and whenever someone makes food for you, it makes you feel loved and appreciated. I definitely feel the same. Who did you learn to cook from? I learned to cook from my mom and my older sister. My mom loves cooking food and loves trying different recipes. She also loves trying food from different cultures as well. I love that you and your mom have that connection. Can you tell me a little bit about you growing up with being a different culture within America and how that made you feel? 
Yeah, so growing up, I remember being in elementary school, and when we went on different field trips, we always had, like, my peers' parents bring different foods for their kids, um, and I remember my dad always offering to pack me lunch, um, like, cultural lunch, um, and I would always refuse because I would always be scared of what other students thought of my food, how I would eat it, and how it would smell. So I'd always bring Lunchables and be like, no, I'm taking Lunchables to school or like PB&J. I always remember arguing with him, but to this day, I really regret it. I went through that also. I feel like it's such a child of immigrant experience to have or that first generation experience. But besides that, did you ever feel any other type of shame surrounding your culture? Yeah, I did. I would always have different kids asking me different questions and different things about my culture. Like, why do they always wear that red dot on their head? And then also about my different foods and things like that. Kids would always say things to me like, do you eat curry every day? What kind of curry do you guys make? Etc. I felt as if my culture was a joke to other students and that made me feel embarrassed about who I was in my culture. Yeah, that's the worst feeling. Can you tell me when did the love of your culture and cultural foods come through then? Um, I feel like the love of my culture and my cultural food came in middle school when I finally got involved in my community and started recognizing who I really was, who I represented, and my community and who my community was. That's when I really started to recognize that my culture was unique and beautiful. Wow, that is so amazing. Can you give some advice to the younger generation or younger people that are also going through the same aspect of shame about their culture? Yeah, really don't care about what other people think. Care about what makes you happy and what makes you feel okay and safe. And remember, your culture is yours and no one else should have a say on what that means. I definitely second that. Can you tell me finally, what makes food so beautiful? The diversity, the diverse foods, all the different spices, all the different ingredients you can add and just the feeling it makes you feel when it's in your mouth. Sometimes it is really spicy or too sweet or sometimes it's in between. My family always makes comments like whenever I eat the tiniest bit of spice and my whole face turns red. It just brings laughter and happiness. The beauty is really the memories you get from food. Thank you for listening to this radioactive podcast and a special thanks to Hina Bohor for the voicing, my mentors Esme Jimenez and Lucas Garlarno, and my editor Diana O'Pong. This is what a normal day at my high school sounds like, but this is what it sounds like at home. Sometimes, I wish the atmosphere at school was more like the one at home. Well, it used to be. I grew up going to schools where I felt free to speak my native language anywhere, but it's not like that anymore. When I graduated middle school, I was assigned to go to Mariner High School. It was the school all my friends were going to, but I decided to go somewhere else, Kamiak High School. I longed for a change, but that change was bigger than I realized. I longed for new faces, new friends, and a new atmosphere. But honestly, in wishing for that at some place new, I felt like I lost everything. My language, my Mexican friends and teachers. I lost my sense of belonging. My sister Paulina and I always attended the same schools, up until high school, when I decided to go to Kamiak, and she made a different choice. She decided to go to Kamiak, and then I decided to go to Mariner. I decided not to because I did not want to be whitewashed, and I wanted to stay with my culture, I wanted to be with my friends. I never acknowledged the differences Kamiak and Mariner had until I had gone to my new school. I didn't have to. I was constantly surrounded by my culture at my previous schools. So I was shocked that some kids at Kamiak would arrive with Teslas and Jeeps and complain about how rich the rich are. Ivan Romero goes to Mariner with my sister, and he says the difference between the two schools is really obvious. Um, I'm like pretty good friends with a bunch of people that go to Kamiak, and um, yeah, it's like from the things they tell me, like, uh, like how their parents are setting them up for scholarships or whatever. Like, I have conversations with those kids. Then I talk to like my Mariner friends who are like, "Oh, my dad wants me to take over his construction company." 
My mom thought that if I went to Kamiak, I would have a better chance of going to college, that I too would have problems like looking for college scholarships. But lots of Mariner students have the same value on education as Kamiak does. So why do people shed such a bad rep on Mariner? My sister claims that they're because of the stereotypes imposed on them. Paulina says the stereotypes of Mariner kids is that they're rebellious or rule breakers. It makes me feel judged because I attend that school and they view me the same. But Ivan thinks this. Um, well, I mean, like, Mariner does have a few students where they would fit the stereotype, but I feel like every school does. Like, there's so much more than that here. And he's exactly right. Mariner has so much to offer. I take a look at my friends at Mariner with so much pride and happiness. They have so many cool things, like cultural clubs, and they even have cultural day. And I've missed that. And I also miss saying hi to my sister in the hallways, or just being able to go up to someone random at school and have a full-blown conversation in Spanish and be like, ¿Cómo estás? Because even though they're just a couple miles apart, the two schools are still different. There's things I like about Kamiak, but sometimes I wonder what my life would be like if I had gone to Mariner. I asked Paulina what she's gained from going there. I feel like the memories. I would take all the memories with me because it, it, it's honestly something you can't, you can't forget about because that's your early ages. That's your coming of age, you know, that really made a change in me being around my friends that are, you know, they're very involved in their, in their culture and their religion as well. I can't say that I regret going to Kemiak. I found some amazing people and a music program I love. And being at Kemiak has given me a different appreciation of myself and my culture, even though I lost so much of it going to this school. And now I'm considering moving to California in the future to be closer to my family and my culture. When I'm there, I eat the best Mexican food and I love it. I'm reminded of my family that came from Mexico and it's an indescribable feeling of honor and admiration. I've realized that being in touch with your culture can help so much in discovering your identity as you grow up. The memories for me have to be the best part too. For Radioactive, this is Eva Solorio. Morning, everyone. Today we're doing a group project about graphing. Check the board for your assigned partners. Ugh, Becca, we don't have each other. At least you have that quiet kid, Liam, who does all his work. Have fun. Gee, thanks. Boo, we're not partners. You have Miss Popular Mia, though. Good luck. Thanks, Trevor. I'll need it. Hey, Liam. You got this by yourself, right? I'm pretty busy, so I can't help. Deal? Great. Um, okay. What the hell? How self-centered could a girl be? It's been a week since I assigned the group projects. Mia, you've failed this assignment because it's clear that Liam did all the work. Liam, I bumped your grade down to a B because you guys were supposed to work together. I hope this doesn't happen again. <laughs> If you had some plain decency and helped me with the project, none of this would have happened. It's just a school project, and I had better things to do than hanging out with you. Thank God it's the weekend. I'm so over this. Did you hear the news? Schools are shutting down because of some virus. COVID-19, I think. We'll probably be back in like two weeks though, aka early spring break. Ugh, Becca, it's been months with everything being shut down and virtual school. I'm so bored. You should check out that new zombie killer game. I hear everyone's playing it right now. It's only 9pm and there's nothing else to do. Might as well kill some time. 
This game's pretty fun. Ooh, 1,000 coins if I add a friend? Okay, there's a list of random usernames I need to choose wisely. Juicy Fat Chicken? I love milk 365. Well, I like milk too. A friend request from Harry Styles is my husband 59? Interesting name. Wild guess. You love milk? Not really. I'm kind of lactose intolerant. And I'm guessing you love Harry Styles? What? How did you know? What can I say? I'm a psychic. Can you tell my fortune? Hmm. I'm getting that you'll marry Harry Styles in the near future. OMG. I knew it. Manifestation is key. Do you have a real name I could call you by? That was quick. Um... Yeah, it's Sia. Like the singer? Yeah, I can't believe that's my name either. <laughs> my name's Leo. It's nice to meet you. So, Sia, want to play around? Sure, but you better not suck. <gasps> Shoot, the zombie's not me! <laughs> Sorry, can't tell the difference. You're about to become my new arch nemesis. New? You have an arch nemesis already? Yeah, it's the suck-up guy from my school who irritates me whenever I see him. He practically yelled at me once. What a jerk. I know what you mean, though. There's this girl at my school who thinks she's better than everyone else, and it's so annoying. I know we've never met before, but you're really easy to talk to. Thanks for listening to me rant. Feel free to rant to me whenever you want. Oh, gee, it's already 2 a.m., but he's kind of nice to talk to. Maybe I'll be playing this game a lot more now. This girl's pretty cool. We've been playing this game for like three months. Thanks for helping me relieve my boredom. How old are you anyway? 16. You? Same. My birthday's coming up at the end of July. Really? Or are you lying and you're actually 60? Busted. Darn it. School's going back in person soon and I'm running out of music to listen to. Any song recs? We've been talking for a while now, so I think I know you well enough to know you love this band. They're super good, and when you get back to school, people will think you're in the know. They're not bad, I guess. I hope we keep chatting when schools go back in person. Sim, maybe we can meet in real life. Welcome back, everybody. I know this is a new environment for all of us, but let's make it work. Check on the board for your assigned seats. Great. You're practically seated five miles away from me, Becca. And that overachiever from sophomore year sits right next to me. I can hear you, you know. And I don't want to sit next to you either. Whatever. Just don't talk to me. Hearing your voice is giving me bad juju. <laughs> Is he listening to what I think he is? At least he has good music taste. Just ignore him, Mia. But did you hear Harry Styles announce his world tour? He's coming to Seattle on your birthday, July 28th. <gasps> Are you serious? Shut up. She kind of reminds me of someone I know. It can't be. You're a Harry Styles fan? Do you get psychic readings to tell you he's your future husband too? No way it's her, right? Why is this kid even talking to me? What did he just say? There's no way. School's been so weird these past few days seeing him. We said we would keep chatting once school started, but we haven't ever since that day. Just say hi to him first. Who knows? You might get yourself a boyfriend. What if it doesn't work out? That's going to be so awkward because he sits right next to us too. I've been wanting to talk to her, but I just couldn't bring myself to. What if it doesn't work out? What's the point then? But we should at least try. You'll never know what will happen. Okay, okay. Today's the day. I'll do it. After class. I'll say hi to him today. It won't work out. There's it no point. Out. There's no it point. It won't work out. There's it no won't point. Work out. 
There's no point. It won't work out. There's it no won't work point. out. There's no point. Is that it? Is this the end? Was it ever real? Thanks for listening to this radioactive youth media podcast created by me, Jennifer Nguyen. And thank you to all my voice actors for bringing my story to life. Rods Marco Hias, Kayla Dumlau, Anna Deep, and Antonio Navarez. A big thank you to my editor, Diana Opong, who voiced one of my characters as well. And mentors, Esme Jimenez and Lucas Galaro. You can find more stories at kow.org slash radioactive. You can also check us out on Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. And that's all from me. Peace out! Hi, my name is Rhea Beecher. I'm 17 and I'm gender fluid. Right now I'm in a place and surrounded by people who love and support me. I'm in a place where I can be free and express myself without being looked at differently or judged. But it wasn't always like this. There was a time when I wasn't in such a positive environment. There was a time when I didn't know who I was, or maybe I did know and just wasn't honest with myself. I grew up in a different home than I'm in now. Until I was 10 years old, the environment I was in made me feel small. It made me feel like the rules were set in stone and that I could never bend them. When I say environment, I mean a religion, but it wasn't just Christianity, it was also my household. You couldn't be who you wanted to be, it was against the rules. Since I was very young, I grew up with Christianity so prevalent in my life. I didn't really hear love is love and be who you want to be. Mostly people just being bossy and influencing you, and telling you who you should be, instead of finding who you really are. Growing up in my family church, things were strict. I mean, even if you were caught talking, or just not paying attention, it was socially acceptable for another adult to yell at you. The way you talked, the way you dressed, all had to be a certain way. And if you didn't follow those rules, you got guilt tripped. When adults tell you to do something, you do what they tell you to do, or you'll be punished. Looking back, this makes me feel like I was bullied. I was told, if you don't act this way, you're not going to go to heaven. When you hear that when you're young, you internalize it and believe it. When I was in fifth grade, I moved in with my aunt, who is now my mom. My mom would tell me that it was okay to talk about what I was feeling. After so many years of not being able to express who I really was, coming into an environment where I could be free felt amazing. You're being told one thing your whole life, believing it because that's what you've been told since you were little. It felt like stepping into a whole new world. In my new household, I was surrounded by people who knew who they were and who they wanted to be. I was in a new school too, and I saw pride flags there and heard people saying positive things about the LGBT community. This was all new to me. From fifth to eighth grade, I was still suppressing who I really was. I was in a safe space, but I didn't feel ready to share who I was with others or even myself. Dear 8th grade me, it's okay to come out. You're going to be okay. I know you're stressing and you think people are going to judge you. But the people that judge you aren't your real friends. The people who are your real friends are going to stay with you no matter who you are. I know you're feeling insecure about dressing more feminine, even though you wish you could. I remember there were times you were so scared to express yourself. Times when putting on a crop top seemed like climbing Mount Everest. But now I have a safe space to dress how I want to dress and talk how I want to talk. And I've never felt more free. Up until ninth grade, I was in denial about my sexuality. I had to push myself to come out of the closet. In ninth grade was when the pandemic started, so I had a lot of alone time. There was no looking the other way, I had to face my sexuality. When I finally came out, it felt like I was carrying a giant bag of rice and took it off my shoulders. A part of me wondered why. Why didn't I do this sooner? I had a lot of feminine clothing that was just sitting in my drawer. During quarantine, I was bored, so I decided to just put some of it on. I felt comfortable, confident, like, huh, this is pretty cool. When I finally accepted myself for who I was, I remember it like yesterday. It was like a broken mirror and I had to put those pieces together to see who I really was. When I did that, it made me catch a glimpse of myself. 
I grew up in a religious environment that made me feel like I wasn't allowed to be who I truly was. But when I finally started to accept myself, I found people that loved me either way. I felt so relieved. I finally found people that helped me connect to Christianity while making me feel safe and loved at the same time. Liz Krantz is one of those people. I met her at a parade on Lopez Island when her family drove by me and randomly asked me to join their float. When I met Liz and her family, I immediately felt like I was home and I was treated like I was their family. They were so kind and accepting, so coming out to them wasn't a scary or hard thing. I asked Liz if she remembered how her family reacted when I came out. She's still like, you know, basically my parents' fourth child. <laughs> we all love him. And he comes and he visits every year and he stays at our house and, you know, he prays at the dinner table with us. We all totally welcome him and enjoy his company, um, regardless of his sexuality. <laughs> so yeah, basically just nothing changed when he came out to us. Um, my parents were like, cool, yay, I'm happy for you, you know, and we gave him a hug and they said they loved him and that was kind of it. Now I've done a lot of self-discovery and just looking at myself and who I want to be. I found a place where I can feel comfortable. I found people who are involved in Christianity that I feel comfortable around. If I could talk to my younger self, this is what I would say. Dear younger me, I want you to know that I've grown as a person and I'm not afraid to be who I want to be. All the times I was so scared of what people thought became really small. I want you to know that I've not only accepted myself, but I've embraced myself. I have surrounded myself with people who lift me up instead of tearing me down. I want you to know that I didn't have to choose between religion and becoming who I really am. I chose both. It's so much better now. It's like breathing a breath of fresh air. Dear current me, there's also calm after the storm. Then the sun comes out and there's a rainbow. Coming at you hot from Radioactive, this is Ray Beecher. That was beautiful. <laughs> I love all these stories so much. I love the creative track. And I love how so many of them were kind of like, they had a deep meaning behind them, even though some were kind of fun and some were more serious. All right, and now I'm gonna invite each of the producers to answer some questions. Um, well, first I'm gonna ask everyone to share something that they're either especially proud of with their story or to share one thing that was challenging in producing their story. And I'm gonna start with the label. This story, it really transformed throughout the whole process. Um, basically, I guess the overall thing I was trying to like commentate on was kind of like the transition between high school to college and like the pressure that high schoolers are under, which is like a ginormous topic. So I think it was definitely a challenge, like narrowing it down to like specific like points in time. Um, but I guess that's also what I'm proud of that I was just able to like narrow things down and come up with like a script that I'm satisfied with. Uh, I guess another thing I'm proud of is like the sound design because this is definitely like the most sound design heavy project I've ever made for Radioactive. And I don't know, I just had fun with it. And that was like one of the, my, my main goals from the start. It was really fun to listen to, I love it. All right, I'm gonna pass it on to Morgan. I think um, one of the things I'm most proud of is even like being able to talk about your sexuality um, is kind of difficult. I don't know why it's so difficult, but I think just the idea of like sexuality and having attraction for other people is just such like an awkward like concept. Um, and I don't think people are really comfortable talking about that. So I'm proud that I was able to explore a topic that I don't even know if I'm comfortable talking about, but I don't want to be uncomfortable anymore. And I think that's kind of the point of the story. So yeah, I'm proud of that. Your story is really beautiful. You've inspired me to consider pole dancing, honestly. Passing it on to you. 
Um, well, I'm just first of all proud that it's done because it was really it was really challenging for me. I found myself to be in a in a position where I felt stuck. And so I don't know, I think just like when I was editing this, it was really emotional for me because I didn't realize it was something that I was currently going through. And I felt like it was something of the past. But, you know, I, I kind of realized that it's it's a continuous cycle that I'm going through. And, you know, I, and I think that all of our stories are amazing in that way that we all learn something and we're all growing in that way. And even for the fictional ones, like, really, it's still really cool. And I don't know, challenging. I mean, the whole thing was pretty much a little challenging because, oh, I mean, making a story that's creative is different than anything that I've ever made before. But I definitely learned a lot in that process. Perfect. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass it on to Jennifer. Um, a challenge I faced was making up a final script and be like, OK, I'll roll with this one because it's a fictional story. I could literally make up anything I wanted and then it would roll. Um, I came into my first edit meeting with like 11, 13 pages. And then I just, yeah, I just went through a huge transformation. And then in the end, like in our last workshop after, even after I had all my voices and edits down, I had an idea to change something. <laughs> um, and I did. And thankfully my voice actors voiced with the time they had and it worked out and yeah. Great, thank you very much. And I also love all the Harry Styles references. <laughs> right? Um, I think I like my overall story, but the biggest thing that I think I'm super proud of is I've always, I think a lot of people know me as a person that like loves my culture, knows that I'm different, all of that. Um, but I think sometimes I'm a fraud because I feel like I'm embarrassed. Like I hate being different. I hate trying to explain things to people constantly. Um, but this story made me feel like it's great to be different. It's great to tell somebody a new story about you. It's always like a fun fact to tell. Um, so I just felt like being unique genuinely is a great thing. And then I didn't have to like fake it till I make it and be like, I am great. Like, yes, I love my culture. Even if like deep down, I feel ashamed. Um, but it, I feel a little less ashamed and a little bit more proud. Yeah. And passing it on to the lovely Raya. Okay. Um, one challenge I faced during this thing was, um, to be honest, Adobe. Um, oh my gosh, that, that took a little bit, but I'm like, I'm really proud that like, I got to like sit back and just look at the story and how it's just like evolved. Like it's, it went through a lot of changes, but like it's gotten so far. So yeah. A few follow up questions. Um, uh, Perea, I'd like to know, how did it feel to reflect on something so close to you on a scale like this? It felt really healing. I mean, like, I remember being in, like, one of the edit meetings with uh, Deanna and Iz, and it was just, like, we talked about ways to, like, heal your younger self, and I was, like, wow. So it, it felt it felt really healing. And Elena, how did it feel, uh, sorry, how did you create that specific effect on the announcer's voice for your story? It was trial and error. It was like watching a whole bunch of YouTube tutorials and trying to figure out what sounded the best. Um, let's see, what was it? Basically, it was like if you looked at my audition, it looked crazy. It looked like a, it looked like a Tetris board or whatever. It was like layers upon layers. So there'd be like, oh, like one thing where it's like, oh, you add like a robotic filter. The next thing you add more bass. Another thing. It was, it was just, yeah, I think there was like in total, like three to four layers, like three to four, like, like layers just for the narrator, just because I wanted to like, yeah. Yeah, it was just a bunch of YouTube. <laughs> it turned out really well, that sounds perfect. <laughs> and then to Morgan, we have a question for you. Quote, I'd love to know more about how you decided to incorporate the history of full and connection to sex work in your story. So I feel like um, that's kind of complicated because I think as I got into poll, my studio specifically, Divine Movement, um, I think does a great job of connecting um, the importance of um, including sex worker voices inside our community and acknowledging that they pave the way for the where we are and what we do. 
Um, and I think it's, it's really difficult because there are some pole places that are a little bit more fitness oriented that do kind of have this separation, like, oh no, this isn't, this is pole sport versus pole is sex work. And I think my, um, my community of pole dancers have really helped me also see that, um, it's really important to put value upon sex workers and, um, make sure that we acknowledge that we are taking an art from another community and we are enjoying it, um, outside of a survival setting. So I, it started there. And then, um, I had an amazing story consultant, Stacey Claire. I uh, read her book, the ethical stripper, and it helped really inform a lot of thoughts and feelings I had. Um, and after talking with Stacy, I really, really felt like I wanted a good portion of my story to also talk about sex workers, but it because I feel like, um, my story, um, with sexual trauma, um, that is not a isolated story. A lot of people experience those types of things. And I think that a lot of sex workers probably experience those types of things and also don't get the same space or respect when they talk about their stories because they are based in sex work. And I think that's truly absurd and unfair. And I think that they should not be gaslighted and their stories should be just as respected as any other person coming forward with their story. So I just felt like it was really important to talk about their part in my community. Now, as a, as a recap, these producers made um, creative track stories, but the news track and the creative track. So this is a question that's open to anyone to answer uh, within the creative track. How did the scripting process work with a more creative storytelling style as opposed to the new storytelling style? Can you stay with the microphone next to whoever wants to go. Um, I just want to say scripting was hell for me. Um, <laughs> I feel like I hate being unnatural. Um, and when I script, regardless of if it sounds like me, I cannot like speak it that way. I will sound like I'm reading off of something. Um, and I really wanted my story to sound natural. Like I was being nice and like cool and like friendly. Um, so I remember like redoing it a bunch of times and not trying to sound super like high pitch or like, oh my God, I love this um, when I did it. Um, but yeah, it was really bad in the beginning, but I was like, it's okay. Cause I don't have to keep looking at this script if it's supernatural, that type of thing. Um, and I also had like really good mentors that like told me to calm down, slow down. <laughs> I get the thing about like slowing down a lot though. That's one thing, yeah. Uh, I think, I don't know, I think I want to answer this because I was one of like the two people with a fully fictional story, which is like a very different process. I think it was it was kind of more, it was like really open ended because I think for a lot of the other stories, they had like an interview or like something to like, like base their script around. But for a fully fictional story, it's kind of just like you do what you do. And like, I guess for me, it was kind of like, there was, there, I think there was a lot more planning. Like I had like very detailed outlines of what I wanted. And like, I knew this is the purpose of this section. This is what I need in this section, stuff like that. And I think it's also another thing where it's like, since it, it was like fully fictional, um, I just got to like play around with like exaggerating characters a lot. And I don't know, it, it was like, yeah, it was fun in that way. But I think the, the, the challenging part was like just getting started because you just have a blank canvas. I was also in the creative track. And I think um, one hard thing that I have is I always feel like I want to be newsy. I think it's almost a way to protect yourself from vulnerability. You can kind of be newsy and therefore you don't have to be as emotional or um, depth in, in depth about how you're feeling about a topic because you're supposed to be almost separated from it. And I think although I wish I could have maybe utilized some more cre creative processes in my story, I had a little section. Um, I think part of creative track is almost allowing yourself to be vulnerable and like tell a story that maybe isn't newsy. Um, so even if you're not using creative audition formats, um, the creative track is, gives you the ability to just, I guess, explore yourself more rather than a news track where you're probably more focused on 
the point that you're trying to make rather than just an exploration of self. So I think that's kind of shown in a lot of the creative track stories as well. Um, does anybody else want to talk about their scripting? It's okay if you don't. Okay. Um, that brings us to the end of our celebration. Thank you for thank you for watching with us. And you will be able to find these stories at kuw.org on the radioactive podcast. That should all come out later this summer. Thank you to everyone who made this program possible, the radioactive mentors and staff, KUW staff and donors, our family and friends, and everyone who's interviewed for a story. We couldn't have done it without you. And we especially want to thank our mentors. We have Noel Gaska, Esme Jimenez, Diana Capilog, and Kyle Norris, as well as our peer mentors, Charlotte Ingram, J.D. Rada Kavahog, Lucas Gallardo, and Iz Ortiz. And we can't forget our editors, Diana O'Pong, Leela Lakehart, Joshua McNichols, um, Liz Jones, Katie Campbell, and Mary Heisey. In our radioactive, we have a tradition. At the end of the day, we do a clap to close. We all just get into a big circle, we clap to finish our day. I'm going to count us down. Come on. Come on. Are we in person way? Where are we? We have a digital way in person way. Zoom way. Wait, zoom way? We're doing it in person way. Okay. Yeah, you start. Yeah. Okay, let me go this way. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what do we do? We're standing.